Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's edition of GeoTalks Online. Today we are very privileged to welcome Professor Ali Reza Malemer from Sweden joining us. Uh, Ali Reza is a professor of applied geophysics at Uppsala University and he, he hails from Iran originally where he completed his undergrad degrees and his MSc and then went on to complete a PhD in geophysics at Uppsala. And as you'll see from this talk, Ali Reza is uh, particularly interested in, in seismic imaging and integrating seismic uh, 2D and 3D imaging, reflection seismic imaging, with uh, potential field geophysical data, both in hard rock environments, but also in urban environments. And so um, you'll see some of that interesting information uh, in his talk this evening. Uh, Ali Reza is a PI on a Horizon 2020 EU project uh, detailing uh, called Smart Exploration and is of course a close collaborator with uh, several of the seismologists and geophysic geophysicists at Fitz Geosciences. So Ali Reza, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, we really look forward to your talk. We have 40 attendees already in the audience and so if you want to share your screen with us now, share your desktop and um, unmute your microphone and we'll get you set up. Uh, thanks, Grant. You can hear me? I can hear you very well. And I uh, yes, need to share. Uh, are you sure you want to share? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I get nowhere. Okay, don't worry. I'll try again. I'll, oh, maybe now. Yeah, uh, let me see. Uh, share. Yes. Ah. Okay, now, uh, now I got it. Uh, so you can see my screen, right? Uh, it is now there, and I'm just going to get your video up there as well. In two minutes. There we go. You are now live and ready to go, anyways. Over to you. All right. Thanks, uh, Grant. Uh, it's uh, how, how how are you, everyone? So I don't see anyone uh, behind, but uh, I'm very glad to be here. It's my my honor and uh, pleasure to this to give this talk. And um, so uh, I, I just gave this title to it, um, uh, don't leave your legacy behind, but of course I did not mean it personally, rather uh, with the data. And uh, much of the talk that I give uh, is it, supported by various uh, organizations, but mainly uh, uh, Swedish Research Council, VR and, and Smart Exploration that you will be seeing in examples. Um, uh, so just uh, be with me for uh, 40 minutes. So uh, I'm going to bring you to um, a, a number of case studies and uh, we're going to see what we're going to learn from them. So the reason I likely um, I'm, I'm here is of course uh, because we have some collaboration with which university as Grant uh, mentioned and I remember uh, back in 2011 when I met Dre in Uppsala and um, got very excited to see him and um, we talk about possible exchange of um, um, uh, researchers and uh, join projects. So I managed to come to South Africa and uh, that was the time I met Musa. And at the time Musa was a student, so this is a picture of us uh, with Ray and uh, one of the platinum mines and, and, and South Africa and of course uh, Penang, which, which I heard the other day that it's, it's, it's closed down due to Corona trouble. So, and of course this has been very rewarding, this uh, exchange of um, um, uh, researchers, uh, for example, Ray and Musa at the moment are adjunct uh, uh, lecturers at our university. And we're happy to see them every year, at least for that reason. And we get a chance at, you know, once in a while to also run with which people. Uh, and here's the example. And I guess the main reason we're all here is that to learn a little bit and, and, and do science. And uh, I guess this um, registration number should also be familiar to much of you. So. Uh, is a picture of me at, I guess, CSIR uh, back in 2011 and a car uh, with a registration number of science. Um, so let's get to some science. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about legacy data, but I need to be honest and I need to redefine this for my own purpose. So uh, let's get the legacy data def uh, uh, defined at least the way I want it. Uh, so I can actually uh, put my talk into it, uh, into this context. So essentially, you know, uh, traditionally legacy data, these are the data that uh, the really old data, uh, hard to recover and you know, they have lost documentation, maybe recorded on tapes. 
uh, but really, this is not what I want to say um, uh, today. Uh, some of the data that I will be showing you, they were recorded on tapes. It's pretty hard to get their, um, uh, you know, their setup, the geometry setup from hard copies. But uh, I want to really make a global definition for this. You know, any any kind of old data that um, uh, that, that have been acquired in in the, in the past, but you could still recover them with adequate documentation and and process them digitally. I guess you can put them into this definition. So there are advantages with with the legacy data. For example, if you look at them, maybe an article about them. And maybe there are, in the article, there's uh, something about the survey, the geometry setup, and, and some interpretation. So the reason why, for example, a certain data set was acquired. Um, and of course, it's pretty difficult to recollect some of these data. You, you unlikely will have the same signal to noise ratio, even you have a good, you know, a good instrumentation, but the background noise is usually higher than, for example, a few years ago, 10 years ago, or. Uh, Let's say the data example I will show you is from 40 years ago, and um, you may have trouble with permissions and uh, the budget now is much more extensive than likely in what it was in the past. And in terms of uh, um, uh, disadvantages, uh, not everyone likes to work with old data, let's say, um, or legacy data. I mean, you talk to a student, they all want to work with fresh data. And, and uh, I must say fresh data, it's much easier. Uh, for many students to get them published, and they should be published. Uh, it's very time consuming to understand, to recover, and, and, and less appreciated and, and rewarded, and especially again, if you want to publish it. And as a, as a university, as an academic person, you want to publish. And it's therefore harder to publish. And uh, as I said, it's easier to publish with fresh data. And, um, um, and if you want to publish, then you also have to find either something substantial or you have to make one. So, or, um, you know, if you can't make it, you have to fake it. Um, but hopefully you have something substantial or uh, you, you have to argue it's a substantial finding that you can publish it. Uh, I mean, the new data we acquired are also very complex. So if you don't really get them documented, uh, you know, in, in 10 years, this is going to be another trouble. So really, we need to document everything uh, about the data acquisition setup, and uh, you know, take pictures, videos, use UAVs, anything we can, and we have to store them along uh, with with the data. Um, so, and I'm not just really advocating we should not collect data because you know the the, the data we collect today is likely going to be the legacy data of tomorrow. So, and uh, and and this is not the really. Um, I'm not 100% advocating we just look at the old data. No, so, but we should look at the old data. Yeah. So, in, in my talk, I'm, I'm basically going to take you through a journey I have gone through. So, uh, I work with legacy data, I must say, um, and these are likely some of the best work I have done in my uh, so far career. So, uh, and in 2003, I started my PhD, so you will see some data, even though these are not really totally legacy data, but I re rework them. So I reprocess them later, you will see them. Uh, when I did my postdoc at GSC Geological Survey of Canada, I was given legacy data from Bathurst Mining Camp in Canada. You will see a very nice example. Uh, I, I came back to Sweden uh, to do, um, you know, I, I became a research associate. I work with some fresh data, but then I had to reprocess them. So another example you will see, uh, this is called Barry's Log and Mining District. This is really where Uppsala is. And we're going to look at some historical, really historical data from uh, uh, Bobble offshore data. This is from um, 89, uh, very deep stuff. So you're going to look at them. And I'm going to show you some very you know, cool uh, examples from uh, smart exploration from Nefsh Korvo, in Portugal and Ludvika mines here in Paris Logan in Sweden. Something was very interesting when I was putting this together, I realized, you know, depending which country you are, you may end up calling your, your let's say, mineral belt district or camp or, uh, uh, you know, you name it. And I, I guess the, the economic geologist guy, they have to come up with one unique name. Uh, it was very interesting to see that. And of course, I'm not going to talk about my retirement, so uh, I would likely be still working with the legacy data. Okay, let's get it started. So the very first data set I'm going to take you, it's in, um, it's from Northern Sweden. It's called Sheleftio uh, Mineral District. So this is back yard of uh, a, a very uh, major Swedish company called Bulliden. 
So these are some of the closed and operating mines. So Krishna Bering is currently the um, one of the operating mines underground. So is a VMS, a massive sulfide. So I think at the time, 2003, for the first time, as far as I know, that um, uh, we acquired two long reflection profile to look into the crust, 12, meter crust, 12 kilometer of top, top of the crust to see what's going on and if there was, um, you know, if we could find any relationship between the, the structures and, and the memorization. And, and of course, later on, a few other 2D lines were acquired, but I think that was pretty much it. And uh, it's a bit disappointing it, uh, you know, uh, more uh, hasn't been acquired um, and I hope it will be acquired soon. And uh, at the time, my task actually was to work with 3D geologic model building, but I ended up uh, processing seismic data. So just going to show you two lines. Uh, so this is Christina Barry, as you can see it here. Uh, it's, um, I'm going to use pointer. So that's a Christina Barry mine. This is 12 kilometer uh, uh, a section, uh, um, line drawing migrated, if you're familiar with it, essentially showing a truncation of a reflection, which at the time we interpreted this to be at the base of the granitic rocks that you see here. A, a meta sedimentary basement there and, and some sort of a structure and transparent, you know, upper crust. If you look at the other line, which is about uh, a five kilometer away, uh, west of this line, uh, which would be this one, we call it line five at the time, you see the same structure. So that's your structural basement. Uh, with that, I mean, it's likely the basement has uh, come up through a fold system. Again, the base of the intrusion and, and dike system here. What was very interesting uh, then was this package of uh, um, reflectivity and diffractivity that got our attention, but it came very deep, four kilometer, you know, three and a half top of it. And it was not so much interesting in terms of being something economic or being a, a potential exploration target, but really got, got our eyes there because it, it really came in a very um, good looking place. Remember, this is now Christina Berry, Christina Berry, and, and the structure, the deposit, they all plunge to the west. So, you know, if you plunge them with whatever deep they have, they may hit there or maybe shallower, but it was too too deep to argue for anything. So this got my eyes. I said, we need to do something on this and if we can get more information extracted. So remember, this is original data. So at the time, uh, uh, we heard in, in Canadian seismic studies, uh, people found beautiful diffractions. So this is a case from Sudbury. Uh, part of a deposit has been mined, part, part of it is intact. And a 2D seismic section and also 3D seismic volume showed beautiful diffractions and, and, and mode conversion from, from the deposit and the part that was uh, backfilled. And, and this is the section that we have. So this is unmigrated, this is also unmigrated, but these are Canadian case, this is a Swedish case. And you can see actually beautiful diffraction we also see in the data. But again, one and a half second, one second, this is too deep. I said, can't we not do anything about this? So what we did at the, at the time, we ran an MT survey. So this is the MT survey, a part of it that uh, you see the model. And you, you nicely see the, the basement that is very uh, conductive and something, you know, sticks up there, but it's pretty much off. It's not very uh, clear if we're seeing the same thing or not. So it was pretty disappointing. So we couldn't actually argue uh, more than that. Um, so what we did then later, we said, okay, let's treat the data something uh, differently. So this is again the 2D line, the, 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 the westernmost line. So these are the two, the two lines that we were looking, line one and line five. And if you carefully look at these lines, it's pretty much crook and um, the red line that shows the geometry of the line. What you see here with the black point, these are clouds of the, 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 the midpoints where really we're sampling the subsurface. And we decided then to treat the data 3D. It's like, okay, let's treat the data 3D um, and, and see what we get. Remember now, now if you got a 3D, proper 3D survey, you would be populating your, your area with, with information. But in this case, you know, there would be areas that you have no information and you would be only limited. So okay, let's let's do this and see what we get. So we we pin the data 25 meter along inline and, and 200 meter along cross line. Essentially, this is pretty irregular, so you can't really pin it irregularly. And, and we said, okay, let's treat this 3D and see where we end up. Uh, so now these are different inlines that you see. So, uh, and again, as I say, different inlines have uh, limited data. So this inline has only this much data, 
this in line longer and as you come in the middle somewhere there you know you get more information but what was really striking the diffraction is actually was picked up in different in lines and and that was really cool but um you know we couldn't still say what was going on and um what then i decided to do there and i said okay let's take a time slice i took a time slice at 1.6 seconds so essentially something around you know four and a half kilometer depth if this is a uh, 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 you know, with the 6,000 meter per second background velocity. And when I look at the time slice of 1.2 second, I was actually shocked because what I could see then was I could see the diffraction uh, um, tail part of it image in the, in, the, in the time slice. And that was very remarkable because I immediately realized uh, because this is a diffraction that I'm seeing a part of this sphere that has been mapped in that time slice uh, in a crook line data, I should be able to essentially reconstruct the diffraction response and say, what would be the, the, the sphere, for example, because this is a spherical, if you make a time slice, you would actually have a cycle. So, and then I said, well, this looks like a simple mathematic. If I have, if I pick three points um, um, along this diffraction tail, or part I see, I should be able to calculate or, or, or come up with the equation of the cycle. And that was exactly what I did. So once I got the, the, the radius and the, the center point of the cycle, uh, it was very easy. Things came very interesting because this X here, this is the fraction response in the stack section. This X here, it's essentially how far you go from an apex, uh, assuming you're dealing with a point diffractor. This is how far you go. That's your time zero where the, the, the diffractor starts to propagate. And that's the time basically would be at um, uh, at X distance from it. And that's your uh, background velocity. So it was very nice. I could actually say the X because I could calculate the radius from this. Because I had the radius, I just made the assumption this is 6,000 meter per second. It's, it's not very far. You could play with this a bit. And because I'm at 1.6 second, so this is known, that's known, this I assume, then I can actually say what's the time zero. And remember now I also know the center of the cycle. I know where it initiates and I can actually tell uh, um, uh, where my diffractor or where I get the source of the diffraction is sitting. And what came remarkable was that I realized the diffractor, and of course you will see that, would not be sitting in, uh, within the plane of this even crook line. It would be rather two and a half, two point kilometer away from the line. And because it's so much away, it also means it, it arrives later in, in the line that you are here, you, you're having here, you're collecting data. So essentially you're fooling yourself that first the target is two and a half kilometer away, uh, assuming it's a point diffractor, I emphasize this because I have a point. The second is not so deep, it's actually be interesting target in a way. Uh, so it was a very interesting lesson from this, this data set that I learned. So I was taken then for my postdoc, I was given a, another data set. So half my leg, it's, it's the historical data set that I think it's one of the known data set that Seismic was directly for, for targeting massive sulfide deposit and it was a, a, a success. So half my leg deposits are like this, so the 2D section, you know, deposit uh, massive sulfide here, you're in the batters mining camp and you New Brunswick, so if you're familiar with Brunswick number six and 12, these are uh, tier one deposits. So half my leg had, of course, uh, uh, exposure here. So it was it was discovered, you know, mined out, and then a few other boreholes did not hit anything until deep EM technologies came and the lower zone was discovered. And I guess a few boreholes, as you can see here, did not hit anything, you know, nothing went on until uh, 98, where at the time Noranda and later Extrata decided to use seismics for, for deep exploration. Uh, they went for a size of 2D uh, surveys first, and then uh, um, uh, I guess they were very smart at the time, not drilling based on 2D targets. Uh, and of course you saw a, a reason that I showed you, and uh, they performed immediately a 3D survey that we're gonna look at it. So there are lessons here. Another lesson a 2D versus 3D uh, seismic, and of course, we're going to look at the, the signature of the deep zone, which is very remarkable. And, uh, and luckily, we had this data to, to play with uh, after eight years. Um, 
Uh, one point here was that uh, I want to uh, cover it later is that uh, you could ask yourself what were uh, European uh, companies doing at the time? Why were they not using seismic as, as far as I know? So, and that's the, the point I would be covering. No, they were using. So 1996, and I will show you another good example that will hit uh, or will beat the half my leg uh, uh, cases. Thing. So how did it look? This is the signature of the deep zone um, uh, uh, as it was discovered. So this is the discovery borehole at 1.2 kilometer depth. The, the signature is pretty clear. The top of the section looks pretty noisy. And I guess at the time they used the best they could time migrated. So PSTM and uh, it's standing out. So uh, of course they drilled every high amplitude anomalies and, and this was uh, um, I think a six to 10 million massive sulfide still sitting there intact. Uh, uh, the PT thing is that the 2D data are not available. So this is a slide from a, a, a 3D. The 2D are not available in terms of shot gather. So you can only have the digital of a 2D and nothing more. How did the 2D look like? So this is one of the 2D lines that we have a digital access, not the raw data that we can actually reprocess. The top cross looks transparent, which you could question. But anyway, there are high amplitude anomalies there. And I don't know if you can spot where the deep zone is but this is the deep zone um, and i will show you comparison where this one is sitting compared to uh, the, the 3d volume so when i reprocess the data as part of my postdoc and um, uh, uh, you know differently i said okay let's try something else because the diffraction were still remember i just finished my phd and the fractions were there i saw it in the swedish case I said, okay let's look at this if we see a uh, diffraction also here and I remarkably saw a, a beautiful diffraction. So what you're looking here is a time slice now from a 3D cube, a proper 3D cube. This is the inline section, which then would be cut here. And that's the cross line uh, section, which would be cut from here. The green zone is where the dip zone is. Uh, but if you look at the diffraction now, so that's a diffraction response. It looks pretty uh, uh, asymmetric with respect to the location of the diffractor. So the diffractor is not really sitting in the, in, and in the middle, as you would expect, rather uh, off from it. And there's amplitude variation, uh, you know, um, uh, along the diffraction um, uh, tail with the highest sin towards the north. So basically it's the north direction. And, and we know now from uh, many boreholes that the deep zone actually dips towards the north. And essentially deep, deep direction reflected itself in the, in the amplitude energy that we see here. And we saw two um, nearly zero amplitude regions that we're still very uh, interested to know what's going on if these are regions of what we say uh, um, phase reversals and and if they could provide information about the, the for example um, um, you know what kind of target you're dealing is it like massive sulfur is just a mafic dot what was remarkable also here that the, the dip zone here is not really sitting at the apex it's rather off and it's a bit higher also um, so these were very interesting uh, finding at the time, and uh, I, I think this is my second cited article that I have uh, among all my publications. If you want to see a beautiful diffraction from 10 million ton, 6 to 10 million ton massive sulfide, this is it. So this is the signature of the dip zone. That's a discovery borehole that hits the, the mineralization, and mineralization sits here. So that's a dip zone again. So. Did we not look at this data, we would not realize that, that the real signature of the deep zone is actually a diffraction of some kind. And the diffraction came in a very strange place that I, at some point, I, I thought maybe this is not really what we're looking and uh, we better migrate and see actually it falls there. And I, uh, because you have amplitude, higher amplitude in the down dip, so you would not, you would know, at, at least now I know that when you migrate these data, this will actually go up there. Uh, most of it and and the energy you got here will actually cancel a bunch of it here and then it has to actually go up and it makes sense now uh, to be at the deep zone so that's a deep zone that's a discovery ball that's where it hits and that's a reprocessed cube migrated and it's beautiful let's look at the comparison now the comparison with the 2d data that's a signature here i should have actually shown our own cube but regardless that's a 2d that's a 3d look at it it looks like at least 500 meter um, away from the deep zone, uh, from where it was seen in the 2D data. And now look at, this is another example. Now the, the 2D data, because the deep zone is, is away, it will show itself deeper. And, and of course, if you start doing anywhere, you are not gonna get anything. 
so because it's somewhere else and and, and it's also shallower so sometimes this could actually be a useful thing to 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 know uh, we put an article a few years ago on the, uh, actually this is 2017 the journal of first break and it's actually very well uh, read um, uh, you know 3000 times um, and I'm not surprised because uh, the examples we put there is a really remarkable examples. Uh, so if you want to see how uh, the deep zone will look like in terms of, I'm just going to run an animation if I can. Uh, back to our option. Uh -huh. No ink, Mac. Okay, here I got it. So I left some footprint. So here is a shot fired at that location. So you see a P wave field is a 2D in a way, but you know the properties are very well constrained. The work of uh, um, my advisor at the time, Jules Balper at GSC. So essentially, what he did, he looked at the mode conversion from the massive sulfide, and what you see is a wave field, P wave field going coming down, so larger wavelength, smaller wavelength. And then we, we, we actually got to know that these massive sulfides really have very strong shear wave velocity. And with the density they got, the mode converted energy that they get, it's, it's much stronger than the P wave. Field. So, and of course he suggested this from uh, VSP data that uh, he could actually see that the, the, the deep zone generated strong SS uh, S to P, uh, um, he called it reflection at the time, but with the 3D data, now you can be pretty sure that was diffraction uh, uh, that was recorded on the VSP data. So the conclusion really here is that the massive sulfide is the primary target. So the, you know, the examples here are showing it, the density, it's pretty good, the high, the shear wave velocity is pretty high. Uh, you know, you can work on mode conversion. The, 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 the P sometimes are pretty good. Uh, P-wave velocity usually is not so high, um, comparable to the background, but the density and shear wave velocity they make up. So depending on the geometry and size, good signal to noise ratio, you really have a good chance to spot them and, and, and get a good image of them and, and target them. So let me get you now to Sweden. So now you're um, a research associate back to um, Uppsala, and, um, and we're going to look at some other data. Now we, we are in Baris Logan. This is really a, a, a district that made the foundation of a Swedish industry and um, lots of iron ore mining and uh, lots of, uh, you know, um, equipment, um, um, you know, companies building equipment for mining industry actually they were born in this region. So we're going to look at two examples. One that comes from a smart expression when an earlier work, it's pretty remarkable from Granges Bay and Blot Barriot. So and I, I could not um, um, not show this picture. So at the time, 2012, that we collected data at Grand Case Bay, we had Musa with us. So, and um, I don't know whether he was used to work hard or not. So we had long days. So here's, here's him uh, sleeping in the field. Uh, and I have this picture of him here. Anyway. So we acquired two lines. At the time, we decided to use drop hammer. So this is not so legacy data, but anyway, two lines. This is really a typical uh, places that you would be collecting data, for example, in, in, in Nordic countries. So you immediately end up in a neighborhood, urban area or city, or at least a village that is pretty decently making noise. So a lot of mines are abundant. So if they want to reopen, you need to know what's going on. And there is usually a brewery fault in many places and not a surprise there's a brewery here uh, uh, you know dispute whether uh, the reopening will reactivate the brewery fault or not and where is the brewery fault it was uh, it was mapped when the mining was happening here and it stopped at six seven hundred meter depth it, it was uh, it was observed at depth and you know if you project that fault it will end up somewhere here but the question was whether you could do it or not so we collected these two lines to see the memorization also if we had any chance to see the brewery for. And remember, because you are, um, um, you know, uh, I guess you know most of the Swedish mines, uh, the underground mines, or especially iron ores, they're, they're mined using sub level caving. So you end up getting uh, um, um, induced faults and fractures that are so, uh, so big, like as you can see here. And, uh, 
and they're going to be really obvious reflections for you. You know, if, if water to fill with water or air, usually water. So they're going to be your obvious uh, reflections. So this is our first attempt back really then. Um, when we look at the data, it looks pretty strange. But anyway, so uh, these are the mineralized horizons, iron ore, uh, tabular bodies dipping in, in towards south, southeast. And these are your um, uh, induced fault and fracture system. And it's not a surprise you, you mine and you cave and, you know, you let the hanging wall to fall. But our interest was, apart from this, was also brewery fault. And really, we couldn't see anything. And we're only showing a portion of the line because the rest of it, it was just noisy, went to the town. And that was where we were really hoping to get the fault in. And then we said, OK, a few years later, um, I had a postdoc work in place and said, OK, can we kind of come up with something that we can improve on the quality of the data? And especially hard rock data have trouble with the statics and essentially to resolve the overburden, heterogeneity and thickness. And we said, OK, interferometry was very popular then. We said, OK, why not we use interferometry to retrieve uh, uh, first breaks, essentially um, uh, get virtual first break at places that are very noisy. And the, the way it worked is, you basically, if you have a short record that is recorded in these two traces, A and B, you cross-correlate them and you get what we say a virtual trace. And if you then convolve your virtual trace with the shot uh, that at location A, you basically produce uh, a super virtual trace at location B. And for the number of shots and receiver, for example, recorded there, you can stack them in order to improve uh, at the quality of your, your first break. And this is exactly what we did. And if I just show you an example where just first break is, is, uh, um, is limited, um, so we're only seeing the first break, and you can actually see the quality of the data is pretty horrible. I must say pretty scary. We only see a first break only here and not not the rest of it. Remember now this is a part of the Grand Gasparri town. And if now we look at the retrieve first break, now it looks actually pretty promising. So something comes there that looks decently to be a first break. So. You can't really be sure unless you pick them and compare them, you get some QC on them. But what we did as a QC, we said, okay, now let's try to pick places we improve the first break and use that for static correction, essentially to get better hold of near surface heterogeneity that is very important to get for reflection imaging. So, and that's what we did. So if we look at now one of the shot record, you see now how horrible it is. So this is one shot. This is a pit that we went on. So that footprint is, is a footprint of a pit that is back actually filled with sand and gravels from the mine and and you you enter to the town and there's not much there if you use the first break from the data to do the statics you now you can do a decent job you know, i thought at the time we were very happy that we got this but you know you're not getting anything more and what you really should you should be hoping it is to see some reflection there seems to be some reflection here but not really much and if you now use the first break that we retrieve and all of a sudden, you know, the thing that looks here to be a signal, now it really makes sense to be a reflection. And, and that was the reflection we observed. And we were very happy. I mean, I must say super happy that we could actually see that one on the, on the improved uh, static solution. And we reprocess the data again. So, okay, now we got to improve the statics. Let's, let's process the data. So now we got the, the, the memorization. We think this is one of the, the I don't know what you would call it, add it or uh, um, uh, one of the tunnels. And uh, and these are, of course, the, 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 the induced faults that I'm not interested in now. And that was a reflection we managed to retrieve. So um, we couldn't get the brewery fault image, but we kind of said, OK, this should be based on the background velocity you, you, you choose and, you know, assumption that this is the fault geometry and it projects to a brewery. It should come somewhere here. And we saw this new reflection. Uh, um, or maybe that one was there, but we saw this one and that one was there. And with the response that should be here, and you see uh, this is a, a reverse fault. Now actually makes sense that this is likely an intact um, iron uh, mineralization still sitting there and this fault is likely faulting another one uh, uh, there. So but essentially these were the two together. And, and this is not migrated. If you migrate, I just show you a sketch. So essentially that's your shaft. This is one of your edits. So this is your mineralization. So this is back, uh, um, this is caved down. And um, 
if you look at it, this would be a, a, the, one of the reflection migrated up and that would likely be the brewery fault. We were still disappointed that we don't see reflection from brewery, but maybe it doesn't have a reflection response. Uh, so let's get something deeper. Um, so we're going to go look at some deeper stuff. This is Babel line uh, and from 90, um, 1988, 89. These were collected. Essentially, the, the game there was uh, uh, play tectonics. Everyone map more and uh, sub more what was going on. And uh, so these these were acquired then two and a half thousand kilometers of offshore data and in the Baltic Sea. Babel 4, this is the image you see, is a remarkable image down to, I say, uh, beyond 20 seconds. This is around 80 kilometer depth. Very beautiful model definitions, even like a step there, bi-divergent features. And uh, at the time, uh, this became a nature article that um, the author proposed polyproterozoic uh, plate tectonic processes was 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 still on and of course Canadian later on uh, had uh, um, their nature article about uh, um, Archean uh, plate tectonic and it was more or less the same feature that you see here at the time this was the best vessel three kilometer long uh, uh, streamer 60 channel and the problem was at least the way we looked at it the very top four seconds had nothing in none of them. And uh, many of the, the guys at the time, they argued uh, uh, with the acquisition setup they had with large air guns, six by eight air guns. This is the, the size of the, 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 the air guns. It will not be possible to get anything uh, at the top 12 kilometer, which was actually disappointing. And I met Richard Hobbs and then Hobbs and he said, oh, he, you know, of course, this is 80, um, 89. Everything was on the tape. He said, yeah, he he rescued the data and he has them digitally. I said, can we have them back in Uppsala? We can actually look at them. And he said, yeah, sure. So we got the data and uh, um, we hired a PhD student, uh, Sebastian Buntin, and uh, he's working on this data. He finished one publication and he's currently working on some other things. But uh, before I show a result that he got, uh, I can just tell you this data set would never like to be acquired again. Um, with such a big guns, you know, and environmental trouble and all those things, it's pretty valuable data set. Let's look at some data example line one as it was processed back in the 91 or 90. Many people reattempted, reprocessed, they got some decent images, but this is what you would see is our attempts. So line one, original data reprocess data, look at the quality of the Moho stuff. So the Moho is coming up, features there I will be discussing a little bit later. We start getting a structure, a shallower depth. Even it looks here, we're getting Moho steps and uh, and something below, this is unlikely, uh, uh, Moho, this is below Moho uh, in the upper mantle. So very, very nice. So let's look at some of these features. So this is a shallow three second, uh, uh, one of the zoom area. Now you can actually see a little mini basin that we re later realized that people mentioned that there, there is a little mini basin sitting in, in the Baltic Sea. So, uh, so we, we kind of know this is actually true and it was missing. So we, this is actually already a proof that you can actually get data in, in the top three seconds. So uh, the, the argument was not totally correct. And if you could do proper job, you know, get rid of all these multiples and, um, and you, know, you know what you're doing, you can actually improve the data. Uh, another beautiful section here, part of the same line, uh, original data, Beautiful, by the way, here seafloor was image. Uh, we kind of got that too. So this is a seafloor drop uh, around 7,500 meter. I will come back to this later. But there are lots of reflections here that looks like a, a you know a basin type. But this is remember is now 12 kilometer and you are in Sweden, so you're not supposed to see sedimentary rock so thick. And uh, and people of course argue these are sales. The divers went to sample. Uh, um, um, at this location and they could manage to see uh, uh, seals, um, well, let's say dike at this position. So let's look at a few other lines, so line six. So now you see uh, you see deeper reflection. This is 22 seconds now, we see beautiful. These two are parallel. I'm gonna come back to these two parallel one later. Uh, this is line seven, another beautiful one. So, and if you wanna see a shallower part, so uh, again, that's the original data. Uh, and this is reprocessed. Now, actually, you can follow the reflection here all the way more or less to the seafloor. And some of these we speculate to be a major uh, suture zones um, that are separate in this part of uh, uh, Barry's logins. Line C, another remarkable data. So, results. So, you see beautiful submoral reflection, another one here. And uh, so, 
already proven you can actually get a lot from even this data set. So let's look at these data. I'm going to show you a few 3D views. Now everything has been reprocessed digitally, so you can actually look at them in 3D. You match Moho. You could try to make sense out of things. So let's look at a few uh, uh, um, uh, 3D views. So uh, now we are in Sweden, so you can see the scale of the whole thing. This is Uppsala. Somewhere here is Stockholm, so it's pretty long uh, line that you're looking at. And if you go a little bit there, you would hit Finland. What was remarkable was we realized Moho was, um, or lower crust appeared to be opto. Uh, remember, these guys were, um, were seen to be dogs. And what we came up uh, in a recent article, we said, this is likely going to be a, um, um, you know, there is a connection between this optome part of the, the lower crust and, and this uh, seal intrusions. And we put an article together, and of course there is a seafloor drop there that we think that's also maybe a feeding dike there. And if you look at uh, the map where the seals been mapped, or seals and dikes been mapped, now we think they're seals. Uh, this is likely coming from sizing, but this is not on, on, on land. Um, uh, so you see actually they have like 80 kilometer diameter and um, we try to argue that these are likely not sheet like um, or they are sheet like but they are feeding each other like a cascade of them nested below ones are feeding likely the, the bulb ones and there are smaller ones also in between and um, and uh, this is just a zoom in so uh, lots of uh, um, uh, melt being presumably coming in, maybe going around, maybe some are also feeding each other. Uh, and we thought that was a very interesting story. And you know, we got it published, um, uh, I believe, last year. Okay, let's finish with some smart exploration examples. So smart exploration is the project that I'm currently uh, uh, coordinating. Uh, lots of examples we have on legacy data, but I'm gonna focus on two that I'm uh, more familiar with. So smart exploration, has 27 partners across more or less Europe, North, South, East, West, and uh, you see our, our partners here. Um, uh, 11 um, research institutions, 11 SMEs, high tech companies, and six mining companies. And we have, of course, EAG valid uh, uh, for dissemination and communication or, or results. Our idea in this case is, is to innovate and uh, get things into market. Uh, the primary targets are critical raw materials, so I'm not going to talk about them here and the project is pretty successful and uh, we're happy that we recently uh, won um, uh, an award for, for the project. Let's look at two examples. So Europe back then was not behind. So at 96, uh, Somincor in Portugal collected seismic data, 2D seismic data. So this was acquired later 3D and these are not the subject of my talk today, but is acquired in the, site, in the smart exploration. So we got access to a 96 data set that crosses this deposit, Lombardor tier 150, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 300 million ton massive sulfide. So it's really a big uh, deposit in the Iberian pirate belt. The data set is pretty low fold, maybe a high fold, but for the time it was acquired. Unfortunately, there is a 91 data set that the row shots are not available and they actually go beyond. And a 3D seismic was, was acquired. So we're gonna, in 2012, so we're gonna look at the uh, line four. That was a work of a, a PhD student of mine, um, uh, George Donoso. So this is a, 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 the data set I was processed. So this one is not digitally available. It's just hard copy 96. Lombardor, now we know it's there, but if you're not really, you don't know what you're looking, you could say it's pretty noisy data. But anyway, now we know that's Lombardor uh, as it was processed originally. The data set was given in 2007 to a company to be reprocessed. So that's what it came out of it. Um, uh, unmigrated, we kind of shifted it so we can actually see uh, the section with respect to the location of the, the, the deposit that's now pretty well constrained with boreholes. And this is our reprocessing work of the same data set. And it's pretty remarkable in the sense that we're not only improving the image of the Lombardor, but also shallow structures. There's a little reflection there. I don't, you don't see it here because it's beyond the, the uh, it's hidden by the, the, the zone there, but that's a zoom in of it and it's unmigrated. And we later realized that there is actually a, a deposit um, uh, sitting there. And if you migrate that section, you can actually see that it falls into, into that section. Now you can actually see it over there. So we really on the old data set, even not just Lombardo, we could actually see even a smaller deposit, uh, which is um, also another success story. That's my last slide. So um, 
taking quite a bit of time. So uh, uh, this is in um, um, Paris log in Sweden. So a two data set was put together and reprocessed. And um, uh, I just show you the reprocessing results um, and um, see beautiful reflection going down. So um, this is magnetic, um, uh, magnetic high here. So you can actually kind of guess these are um, iron oxide deposits. And um, there are features that we see from, you know, coming from different directions. And um, um, we speculated these are mineralization. We know that continues down to 800 meter depth. So that's a known deposit from the deepest borehole we have. And uh, we managed to speculate this is likely going deeper to 1200 meter. There may be another one underlying. We were not pretty sure who we were looking here. We kind of speculated these are fault, but at the time we were also guessing these could be a migration artifact if you're familiar with seismic data. But the recent 3D seismic data that we acquired in the area, we beautifully picked a, a reflection coming here and uh, we're pretty sure, well, we kind of convinced these are likely a fault system that is cross-cutting the mineralization. So let me finish about um, what's the magic on all these things. So I think the magic is not, uh, uh, you know, there's no single recipe in a way how you can improve uh, legacy data and, and, and your reprocessing. So you really need to spend time and sometimes the time you spend may not be so much justified. So I would say uh, academic, uh, academic organization, universities are really well suited for this kind of work because you know they, they really want to get something out of it and uh, they can they can put time they can they have their kind of motivation to publish and uh, very successful doing it and so there's no single recipe if i want to give so every data set has its own trick so you need to really go through the history of the data geometry look at the observer log we have got improved images just simply by fixing wrong geometries so bad geometries uh, shots were set to be here in this location, but if you look at the data, it doesn't make sense in somewhere else. It worked for us, I think, is a uh, you know we we were so interested to see what's going on with different features, and we managed to get them improved. The statics remains to be the the main solutions, and of course, getting rid of the noise. And we're likely going to do more um, um, uh, reprocessing of hard rock seismic data and showcasing this. And uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for taking your time and listening to me. Ali Reza, thank you so much. That was a really, really fascinating talk and I think pertinent for many of our colleagues that I know were watching uh, from industry, but also in, in, in research as well. So thank you very much. Do you have a time for a few questions? Because there's a few questions that have come through. I have time, so. Oh, wonderful. So <laughs> you can leave your, leave your slides up in case you have to go, in case yes. you have to go back. Um, so the first question that, uh, that comes from Ray, I think Ray Durheim, uh, mm -hmm. is in your view, is there any merit in using multi-component sources and or receivers? Yes, um, if absolutely, at least for some of the cases, um, uh, in some of the shallow, um, there's a near surface studies, we show bedrock beautifully came into a, you know, Ray, I guess you know, we have a three component land streamer that in one case a study we saw beautiful bedrock was nicely picked up on, on the transverse component. And because it, the, the, the shear wave velocity is so slow, we could nicely resolve, you know, very nice undulation of the bedrock. So if that's on the receiver side, on the source side, if you go three component source, three component uh, uh, receiver, um, I'm actually not sure if we do have actually anyone have acquired this nine component data for hard rock imaging. But on, on three component imaging, and um, I guess the example of uh, Gilles Belfer on the VSP data, uh, the fact that the VSP is three component there, uh, he shows beautifully that uh, the VMSs have all those beautiful mode converting energy. And, and sure, I mean, we should. Um, at least, you know, somebody should try to do some pilot studies. Okay, great. The next one, um, seismic imaging using ambient noise as an energy source is being vigorously promoted. In your view, what are the pros and cons of active versus passive source? And that's from Anonymous. Um, I, I think, um, let's put it this way. So I'm, I'm from university, so there, there is a merit to, to learn from passive, uh, but we shouldn't oversell it. So, uh, and I think currently many are overselling it. The fact that uh, uh, we the passive there are low frequencies 
um, even you kind of try to retrieve the shear wave velocities from the surface, you're still limited with the resolution you get because you kind of, you know, you're dealing with one hertz, let's say two hertz signal. Uh, you can claim five hertz at some point uh, if you can really uh, have it. Um, and then you really don't have the wavelength. You can resolve the structures and sometimes small objects. Uh, so I, I would say in terms of doing this academically, it's a, it's a very popular thing and we should be doing it. But in terms of we start selling this as a you know, problem solver, I don't think we are there and I don't think it will be it will be a way uh, to do it. So. OK, the next question. Um, is something slightly different, more geological, I guess. Um, could the saucer-shaped sill that's on the Babel line near Sweden be the result of an impact structure? Uh, uh, like everyone is, everything is, you know, pressed down. Um, no, like a like a like a meteorite. A meteorite. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I got I got that. I got that. Uh, okay. You know, the, the, we got very uh, famous impact structure, and I forgot the name, but it was also drilled uh, and. Uh, uh, how was it? Of course, impact structures that we got here is younger than the seals we got. Um, I I could only say likely not. If somebody is thinking the melt is maybe generated from the impact, like if the, or unless you talk about the geometry of the the seal. No, it, it can't be. Um, uh, I don't think we have any evidence that uh, the melt here. I think this is obviously very. Uh, uh, it's possible for geologists to understand if the melt here was as a result of an impact or not. So the melt here is, is likely primary, so it's not, uh, it's not from an impact. And, and, and with the saucer shape uh, um, structure, what we actually told, it was as the melt was coming up, uh, uh, you know, and we had, of course, uh, we, have, we, we still have two, three kilometer of uh, uh, sediments um, above here. Um, what we told it was, it was downfolded. So essentially, while you were injecting melt, you were making void in, in, in the subsurface, essentially, and then you were downfolding the, the, the structure down. So what we think maybe this pattern that we got is kind of uh, uh, manifesting that, that um, um, uh, you know, that scenario. But uh, the seals are not, I don't think they are a result of an impact. OK. Great. And the last question, perhaps the, well, one of the most pertinent questions, um, and this is from George. How can one determine if a legacy data set still has value and is worth revisiting or if it's just useless old data? Uh, I think the question is, how can we, like right before we touch on it, we kind of um, get an idea whether it's uh, valuable to look. I think maybe one should look at what's available from that legacy data and uh, get a first judgment. I mean, it's, it, I mean, look at it this way. Um, some of the algorithm that we have today, they were not available in, um, uh, let's say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we didn't have a DMO correction. So we couldn't really get hold of crossing events uh, uh, 30 years ago. So if you expecting from your geology to have a crossing events, say, you know, full crossing your geology, you would not be able to get them perfectly imaged. So it's pretty obvious that that, that part you can actually resolve. So uh, so if you just look at it, what's been, what was done to the data and uh, how it was acquired. Uh, you can immediately guess what you could do. Uh, okay, that's great. Well, that's that's all the questions that the audience has. So Ali Reza, thank you once again very, very thank much. You, we really appreciate it. And just to remind the audience before you leave, that um, next week's talk, and I'll just bring that up very quickly so that you can all see it. Next week's talk uh, is by Glenn Nawila from the School of Geosciences talking about uh, the significance of granite greenstone terrains and the formation of Witwatersrand type gold. Should be very interesting. And then the week after that, we have Renee Boyson who's doing her PhD at WITS. Uh, and she'll be talking about innovative developments in multi-sensor, hyperspectral remote sensing for mineral exploration. So we look forward uh, to all of you in the audience joining us then. And of course, if you um, are not on our mailing list, you can just click on this link on the first comment in the Q&A and that'll take you to our subscription form. So thank you all for joining us and we will see you next week. <laughs>